recording. There we go. All right. Uh, so where we left off was building the rim on, uh, well, less yesterday, right? Um, and we saw that that was really just a combination of building a cylinder uh, based on the cursor position, right? We set the cursor to kind of be, which I'm going to do again here today on this wheel to show you how to snap this over there. Um, very, very similar process to how we snap the cursor, actually, believe it or not. So that'll kind of be some reinforcement there. And then we just made sure to kind of figure out the math, right? The simple math, the simple arithmetic for how we wanted to do the rims, right? I decided, hey, I wanted four polygons. When you're building a rim, it's you want to kind of think of it like a, a slice of pie, right? Because you've got one spoke, and you really want to make it look as cool as possible and then just duplicate that spoke around as many times, as many slices of pie as you want, right? And I really only wanted a total of five spokes, right? Um, so I figured, hey, five times four, right? Four polygons, because I wanted four polygons for their spoke. Um, and then we just got rid of uh, everything but the four polygon slice of pie, did the modeling for that, and then we just used that uh, duplicate spin feature, right? So if I was to go, say, into like three for object mode, we could see that there is, right, the spin feature down here, but if we hold down the left mouse button, there's spin duplicates. And that gave us those options for how to spin uh, these guys and then merge them. You'll notice it actually over merged a little bit here and here, which is not really hurting us. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful with when you're going into doing the merge feature, right? The merge vertices that you don't make your uh, tolerance too high. Um, in this case, I did it a little too high and it got a little bit extra there, but um, not really hurting me there. So just be aware of that. Um, and remember, that was just, you know, vertex mode. And then, of course, we did, uh, um, I don't have vertices selected here, so I might want to select a couple, <laughs> right? Um, when you right-click, right, merge vertices, there is by distance, and that actually gives you control over a distance from each other that all merge. And you always want that quite low when you want to merge stuff that should be on top of each other. Um, we kept these as one object. Of course, we could have made these rims as their own separate objects. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. I just decided I want to keep it all together. Now... Remember, when I set my cursor here, I set it to this edge loop, right? Two for edges. I set it to this edge loop. So what I want to do is I want to go find the exact same edge loop on the back tire. So double left click, right? And then, of course, I can go to Mesh Menu. And we see in Snap there is Cursor to Selected. And what that does is it snaps that cursor to the selected edge loop, right? Remember, I just hit F to fit selection, right? Um, just like Maya does it. Um, F frame selection. Um, so now you see the cursors over there. So what I could do is I could go back to three for face mode, select a face on the rim, select linked, right? Remember that's the select menu linked right there. All right, space bar for me because I set it to that. And then what I could do is I'm going to copy this, right? I'm going to hit Control D for duplicate. And I'll just left click just to make sure the duplicate's there. And if you were to move it, you could see it's, you know, moved off. Um, but now I'm going to go back to Mesh, and I'm going to go Snap, because you'll see that you could actually do Selection to Cursor Keep Offset, right? So if you go back to that Snap feature where we had Cursor to Selected, you could actually Snap Selection to Cursor. Uh, I usually like Keep Offset, because that'll move it properly over there and keep the proper position. And you'll notice that if we selected the same edge loop on the rear tire, that that will snap that back there nice and neat for us. Obviously, if we had something not exactly like that we could always play with our snap tools right because the magnet here and snap to grid you could do snap to vertex similar to maya but when you have something like snap selection to some of these options right take advantage of it right that's kind of neat <laughs> so remember there is a snap selection to cursor so and you could snap your cursor to select it right so um that's actually a really really neat feature that blender has that makes it really easy to copy that rim and line it up to here super quick and easy. Now remember, you can go back to Mesh, Snap, and you see you can snap cursor to world origin. You see how that sets the cursor back to the 0, 0, 0 of the world? But that's basically how you make a rim. Right? We saw that with uh, yesterday's lecture and the video for that. And that's how you copy the rim over there. But it's cool because we got to see a bit more of that Mesh Snap cursor to select it, as well as the fact that you can actually snap selection to the cursor. Uh, really neat. So once you start understanding that what your cursor can do and what some of these features can do, and that you can combine it with like your um, transform orientations and your transform pivot point, you have a quite robust system for easily reorienting your objects to different stuff. 
Um, Maya's just not as good at this stuff stock, right? Um, Moto is. Um, and I, as I spent more time with Blender, I realized Blender was as well. And Blender has a couple of its own really cool things. Like uh, I absolutely love Active Element. Active Element's so cool. Remember, we saw that kind of stuff on our, our uh, the um, uh, grates, right, that we had for the front, um, front of the car, right, the front kind of uh, area. Uh, so hopefully, particularly on the car, you guys have gotten to see a lot more about how these work, how these work, and even how Cursor works to do some neat stuff, right? Not something you need a lot on a character creature. Um, we find we didn't use it that much on our building stuff, but when you get something like this car, you might find you use that stuff a bit more, right? So um, the car video in particular, uh, I've really kind of tried to emphasize some of these features a bit more um, and how you're not always going to need them, but when you need them, you're glad you have them, and Blender's got quite good versions of them. Uh, and, but that also includes the cursor now. All right, so that's a great place to kind of just say, hey, cool, awesome, right? We've, we've got the, that done. Uh, of course, I could go right back in here and we can start to turn on all of our other objects, right? There we go. And we can see we basically have a car now, right? Now, you could always put like an extra uh, cylinder back here if you wanted to, um, just to kind of make sure that there's a, a back piece here, um, like a brake, like a disc brake, right? That might be useful to have back there. Um, that would just be a cylinder, just like we kind of were doing before, right? You could just create a, a, a cylinder based on a cursor, snap the grid back there. Um, I think we'll just kind of leave that for you guys to worry about. Um, so now at this point, we want to start to think about um, getting this guy to a better low res state, right? We know that if I say go to this object here, the body, and I get rid of that subdivisional surface modifier, we see that's not horrible looking in low res. And its polygon count is really small, right? We can see that that's actually really only 593 triangles, right? Um, so that is one of those things that, remember, one of the things we want to be able to do for this, right, is actually properly um, subdivide this, right? So remember, one of the things we could do at this point is say, okay, we want to take these ones that have subdivision surface modifiers on a mirror, and we want to apply these modifiers, right? Now, I've got this guy turned on. I think it's super useful. But generally what I do is you apply the mirror first if you're going to do this by uh, one at a time. It's always a good idea to apply the mirror first so that the clipping works properly. And then you can click on that little pull down and apply the subdivision modifier. And now you'll see that that's your low res. And you'll notice that uh, now it's giving you the proper triangle count. Uh, the statistics menu, do, I, th I really do feel like in 2.92 is better updated for that. Remember, it's just this right here, statistics. It's better at showing you the actual subdivisional multi-resolution count, I think, if I remember correctly. I've only been you know, playing with 2.92 a couple days. Uh, <laughs> but you see how now this low resolution for the whole entire bulk of the car body is for almost 5,000 triangles. That actually, when you look at that, is about the resolution the vast majority of cars that you will ever make for any pipeline will be. That's actually a little low res, right? Um, you can easily get cars for racing games that are 200,000 triangles. Now, granted, there's, you know, the, the characters sometimes included in that and the interior and all those things. You might have engine parts as well. But this car is really not going to be terribly dense. And a 500 triangle car is the kind of car that you're almost never going to see in most pipelines nowadays, right? So that's one of the things about this subdivisional surface modifier, right? If you really do not have the polygon budget to use it, like you really do have to make a, poly a car that's like 2,000 triangles, don't even touch subdivision modifier, right? Don't even touch it. Don't apply it. Work low res. But if you easily have a budget of 30, 40, 50, 60, 100,000 polygons, triangles for a car, you can easily use subdivision surface modifier to make it easier to get to this level, right? So that's one of the things, remember, is that if you apply your subdivision surface modifier and you've got it on, you should at some point actually properly apply it, finalize it, right? That's uh, like Maya's version of smooth, right? Uh, we were just using this as a shortcut. Otherwise, I would have to add in all these edge loops by hand, make sure to round them all by hand, um, you know, even though you can adjust some tension controls, those are far from perfect. I've spent enough time with Maya's and Blenders to know that they're they're useful, and you're definitely glad to have them when you need them, but they're just not as reliable and predictable as they should be. 
so for me, this method just makes my life a lot easier. So keep that in mind that we, I want you guys to actually apply that subdivision service modifier at some point, right? So we can go to the hood here. We can see that that needs to be applied. Um, now remember, this right here is a, 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 an add-on, right? So I'm going to go to Edit Preferences just to remind you guys where this stuff's at. Add-ons, right? Um, remember, you want to get the text tool add-on uh, if you want to properly unwrap the uh, tires. Um, you want the, te uh, the text tool add-on. Uh, so UV layout, of course, I've turned on, right? Um, you see modifier tools are on, right? That's actually these right here. Right, so I check this on, and you'll see that this becomes available in your interface. Just like auto mirrors available, edit mesh tools and loop tools, those ones that show up when I kind of hit edit here. Um, way down here, you'll see um, UV Magic I already have on, and text tools. Now remember, to add, and if you go to some of the earlier videos, I've, I show that, right? To add an add-on, right, that's not one that comes with Blender, almost all of those come with Blender. You just check them on. You find them, check them on. But the text tools is a free download, right? You basically just go text tools for Blender. It'll take you to like GitHub to download it, right? Uh, I've got earlier videos for that stuff. But what you do is you go to install, you find where you've downloaded that zip, and you just double click on the zip, and it basically installs it. And that will give you your text tools. So remember, uh, there's some great add-ons that Blender comes with you can turn on. And there's some great free ones, right? In particular, text tools, right? Um, and that gives me this. You could delete all, you could apply all. So it's really cool. You just hit apply all and it does, it applies all of them, right? So there's our lowers for that one. I could go here, apply all. And you see how we start to get these all to be our low reses? Now, if you don't have that, if you're confused on it, right? Uh, you can always do these manually, right? You can go to the little V's right here for your modifiers, right? Remember the blue wrench? Apply the mirror first. There we go. Then apply that. So you just, you know, left click on that, apply. There we go. See that's been applied there. And you can see we're just slowly kind of going through here and just making sure to kind of uh, get these all set up. See that one I think needs to be applied all as well. There we go. And then last but not least, we can just grab the tires and apply all. Uh, I think the interior needs it as well. So let's... Uh, Apply all. I should have grabbed all of them. Yep. And I think there was just the seats. Apply all. And so that makes your life pretty darn easy, right? Makes it pretty easy to kind of get in there and get those all set up for you. Um, and then you know, if I select everything and I hit uh, three for faces, you'll see that those are all at their um, final resolutions, right? That's actually low res. There's no subdivision service modifiers on it. That's looking pretty good low res, isn't it? Doesn't even really look low res. And you'll see that their triangle count is just shy of 31,000 triangles. That is a car that can work in the vast majority of pipelines nowadays, even video game pipelines, right? All you have to do is look at Spider-Man Miles Morales uh, or any open world game that's got a bunch of cars in it and all that stuff. And those cars don't look super low res, do they? You'll notice they're probably about this polygon count, if not higher. Uh, racing games can weave a higher than that. So if somebody tries to tell you your car should only be 3,000 triangles for video games, they are full of it. They are so full of it. I'm like, what What game are you working on? Maybe a Nintendo Switch game, but the Switch is not exactly a lightweight, right? Um, so believe it or not, this is you're usually going to be building cars at this resolution or higher, right? So there's no reason you can't use subdivision service modifier if you're smart about it, right? Keep in mind what your actual target budget for your vehicle is. Uh, we did keep it simpler so that we could focus on the primary forms. We, now, if we wanted to, we could come in here and add extra details. Um, and you do want to apply it, right? You want your low res to look good. We were just using the subdivision source modifier as a great shortcut for us, right? As a way to get there quicker and easier without having to add every edge loop in by hand, right? Um, nothing really wrong with that. It just will take more time. Right, and as we've seen, many models, it's subdivision surface modifiers not appropriate for it. Right, if you're building buildings and desks, low res put bevels on stuff. Right, <laughs> but when it comes to cars and creatures and spaceships that are going to be tens of thousands of triangles and have lots of rounded curvature, 
if you're smart and you're effective about using your subject service modifier, it could be a, a, a time saver, right? It could be a time saver. All right. So now we're at this point where we're ready. And you can always take out extra edge loops, right? Two for edges. I can go in here and say, hey, I'm not sure if I need every one of these edge loops, right? So it could be really quick and easy just to come in here and, you know, shift double click a couple times, right? I usually kind of grab every other edge loop. And then, of course, delete, dissolve edges. And you see how that almost affected the shape? Not at all. So basically, if you select edge loops that are kind of alternating, right, kind of every other one, you'll notice when you take them out, you can keep a lot of that curvature for yourself. Obviously, you see that becomes a bit blockier. So it really depends on if you need to be that efficient, right? But you can always go back in and very quickly and easily take out a few edge loops if you need to, right? I can tell you right now, it'll be quicker and easier to take those extra edge loops out than it will be to add them all in, in manually. So if you still find, hey, man, I'm like a couple thousand over, go in there and just find the expendable edge loops, right? The edge loops that if you take them out, it'll affect the shape very little. Uh, particularly if you're taking several out, um, kind of alternate every other one so that it maintains a lot of the original curvature you have, right? So just these little tricks that years of experience of wanting me to get there quicker and easier and not being afraid of the subdivision service modifier um, have taught me. Uh, we're fine. Like I said, 30,000 triangles for a car is pretty normal. Obviously, we could have done more detailing in certain areas, but at a basic level, this is what most of your car would look like. Um, all you have to do is look at the actual base meshes and wireframes for the tons of cars out there, even video game cars, and you'll easily see that this is right on that target, right? But you can always take a few edge loops out here and there, or some parts of the model you don't work in subdivisions, right? You don't have to apply a subdivisions modifier to every part. Um, just trying to really get you guys to use it as effectively as possible. All right. So now what I want to do is I wanted to quickly kind of just go through and UV unwrap um, the tires and uh, maybe the whole wheel just so we have that as kind of an option. So I'm going to go through here and I'm just going to kind of turn everything off. There we go. Get ourselves to the wheels. And remember, what we can do is we can go to the UV editing window, right? Right there. And uh, usually I go to UV maps here because it's named, right? You go to, so if you go to the, um, you know, see the little green triangle, this will have a section called UV maps you can open up. And we can double click on this and call this wheels, right? That way we've got that named. The nice thing is even if you don't name these, other UVs won't override it. Um, it's just it becomes a lot easier to tell a texture to go to proper UVs when they're names. So it's good to name them. Uh, you can always name them after the fact too because they are attached specifically to that object. And what we want to do is we want to go to three for face mode. And uh, in this case, I need a few seams, right? So I'm going to go in here and uh, go to two for edge mode. And I'm going to double left click on that edge, right? And actually, what I'm going to really do really quickly is I'm going to go to uh, three for face mode. Um, Alt X, remember, that's your X-ray shade. And that makes it easy when you have rectangle select on, right? Q to cycle through to the rectangle. When you do a rectangle select, it will grab everything when X-ray shade's on. If you have X-ray shade off, it will only grab what it sees. So uh, if you're trying to grab everything uh, with a marquee select, X-ray shade's a great little short to get have on, right? Uh, so I'm going to hit uh, delete, delete faces, because I can always mirror that over later on. It's be easier to, to do that later. Alt X two for edges, and what we're going to do is we're going to uh, double click on this edge right here. There we go. And I'm going to cut that, right? I'm going to make that a seam. So you right click, right? You right click, it brings up your edge context menu. One of them is mark seam. So there we go. And remember, UV unwrapping is the process of uh, taking a model and turning it into a bunch of uh, different coordinates that are still attached to the model, that still reference the model that basically kind of are the model, but kind of peeled off to be two-dimensional uh, so that a texture can go on, right? Because a texture is a two-dimensional image, like a JPEG, a PNG, a Targa. Um, so that's how you mark a seam. And then, of course, we go to three for face mode, and I'll just hit uh, Control. Actually, in this case, I think we'll just um, do Alt-X, and I'll select just these. There we go. And we can see that we see the UVs there. So now what I want to do is I want to go to UV. 
right, the UV menu here. And you'll see there's unwrap. And we just do unwrap. And what that'll do is that'll unwrap this for us. Now, in this case, you see how we're kind of getting a little bit of weirdness with uh, this guy. Um, in this case, uh, I think I might just select connected on those and just do a quick... Uh, and if you uh, do uh, uh, Shift H, right, that'll hide everything else. And then we can just do a UV unwrap on that. And what am I, what am I getting weird with, with that one? Probably should have a few seams on that guy, I think. Um, but for right now, that's okay. Uh, I'm going to undo a step. Uh, Alt H will unhide everything. Uh, in this case, uh, I think I just wanted to show all these guys. There we go. Uh, remember, one of the great tools, and this is important for our this right here, and this is part of our text tools, right? So remember, if I click on this little V right here, right, that opens up this. And there's text tools, right? Now, in this case, uh, you'll notice if I open the UV layout menu, there is something called rectify. Now, what I can do is I can go to 4 for object mode in here, right? As long as those are selected, you can hit 4 to... Uh, go to object mode here, and it's basically island select, right? So one will select vertices, two will select edges, and you can double click to select edges. Three will select faces, circle select and tweak will all work in here as well. So all those tools work normally. Four selects a whole shell, and there is something called rectify. And what that does, that takes kind of this tire, and you see how it makes it into a rectangle. And that is important, right? Particularly for us texturing this tire tread. That is important to make into a rectangle, right? Because we have a geometric texture pattern we're going to paint on there, right? That we want to look good. And without it being rectified, it's not going to go on properly, right? It's going to get a little bit of stretch. It'll paint weird. Um, any highly geometric or uh, re repetitive pattern like a tire tread pattern or like diamonds that you want to repeat over a hose or even just that corrugated kind of Nice clean line effect. Remember when we did that on our um, our pipes for Project 2, right? For our little mainframe thing we did for our environment room. We did that because we have a highly geometric pattern we want to put on here, right? So we really kind of need to make sure to get that uh, set to a rectangle. Um, in this case, I really feel like we should probably help the uh, tire out here. So I'm just going to grab that face, select connected. Uh, I'm going to do Shift H, right, because that's hide faces, right? You'll notice if you go to, um, I remember what that is. it's in mesh. Uh, if you go to mesh, you'll see that there is show hide, right? And you see how there's your quick keys for hide selected, hide unselect, reveal hidden, Control H, Shift H, Alt H. Uh, so remember, you can hide specific polygons uh, or unhide them. In this case, I do want to kind of mark a few seams on this one to just help it out with this. Uh, I also think that that seam has screwed us up, so I'm going to grab that. One for vertex mode. Merge vertices by distance, right? Just make sure to give it a bit of decent distance there. So it starts to merge some of those up. And then, of course, if I want to, I could always grab these. Right-click merge distance, since it's only two, and I can do at center. And then at center. That might be off a little bit shape-wise, but we don't really see that, so we'll kind of let it stay. All right. So I go back to face mode. Select all those faces. And let's see if we can unfold that again. By hiding the rest of it, it allows you to just unwrap what you see. And you see how that unwrapped worked better? In this case, that might be a little bit big for this, so... Um, Kind of depends on what you want to do with it. Um, if I do, um, right, Alt H, that brings back everything. You see how it actually didn't screw up the rest of these? So that's kind of neat for that kind of stuff. Um, remember, what's great about the text tools also is I could go here to say 1024, and I could do a quick checker map just so we can kind of get that cool preview of what our UVs are looking like. And remember, the checkerboard lets us see if there's a lot of distortion. In this case, we can see that the distortion's pretty low on this, right? It's not terribly bad. Whereas we can see over here, 
you know, it's actually not too horrible there, but it's a little bit different. All right. So just kind of trying to remind you guys about that, and we'll kind of keep doing some more um, work on this as we go. We'll do a little bit more for this on Thursday before we texture paint. Because so I do want to copy these exact UVs over the other ones, right? But I figured it'd be good to kind of get us started on that, seeing some of those things. It's already 937. I'm going pretty far here today. Um, but I did want to start to get you guys using the text tools again. Um, remember, just do a Google search for text tools for Blender, uh, and it'll bring up a link for it, and you can download it. Um, some of the vi earlier videos um, also show how to kind of set up those add-ons, right? Uh, and if you guys have a, a specific question about that, you can always ask about it, right? All right. So let's say stop recording on that.